again, my name is Christopher Gagne from MassDOT's major project section. And I'm the project manager for this project. This meeting has been advertised in the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, the Charlton Villager, on MassDOT's Facebook and Twitter accounts, through the Charlton Council on Aging, the Oxford Council on Aging and Senior Center, the Central Massachusetts Regional Planning Commission, and Venture Community Services. Special thanks to the town of Charlton and Oxford for helping promote this event. This meeting's presentation will begin with an introduction of the project team. Then we will provide an overview of the project, cover various elements of the design, including the Oxbow Road intersection. We will also discuss construction activities. At the end of the presentation, we will outline the next steps and how we will keep you informed about the project moving forward. Once the presentation is complete, we will conclude, the, we will conclude this evening's meeting with a period for questions and discussion. The team for this project consists of staff from Mass DOT Highway Division and the Design Build Construction Team. Again, my name is Christopher Gagne from Mass DOT's major project section and I'm the project manager. Joe Frawley is the operations engineer from District 3 office in Worcester, which is responsible for overseeing the construction of this project. The resident engineer from our district construction is Clodian Polisi. The design team consists of a team of both contractor who is responsible for the construction of the project, along with a design engineer, which will finalize the design. Jack Harney, the project manager from DW White, will speak later about the construction staging and early construction activities. Lenny Velichansky, the design manager from Trans Systems, will talk about the elements of the project design. Sarah Peritsky from Regina Villa Associates will discuss how we will keep you informed about the project. Some of you may have joined us when Mass DOT team met with the public in May 2021 for the 25% design public hearing and or the previous public information meeting from February 8th of this year. Since the project was advertised as a design build project, the steps since the public hearing were different than for many mass DOT projects. The project was advertised for design build last April and teams that combined contractors and designers submitted proposals and bids. Once the project received a notice to proceed last November, the selected team of DW White and Trans Systems was able to prepare to begin early construction activities while refining and finalizing the design. We are meeting tonight to update you on the design and to discuss those early construction activities. Next, I will re review why this project was initiated. The project was initiated because the combination of high speeds and narrow roadway has resulted in a roadway that is unforgiving. There is a history of crashes, particularly severe and fatal crashes along the corridor. Additionally, there is existing congestion, particularly in the vicinity of the intersection of Route 20 and Route 56. The bridges over the Little River and French River are both functionally obsolete. There are also limited facilities for pedestrians or cyclists within the project limits. What is the scope of the project? To set the scope of the project, the team will need several goals and objectives. The goals and objectives are to improve safety, improve multimodal mobility, which means improving facilities for pedestrians and cyclists, as well as improving operations for motor vehicles. Additionally, the project will replace the functionally obsolete bridges over the Little River and the French River. The project will be reconstructing Route 20 between the intersection of Richardson's Corner Road and Oxbow Road in Charlton and the intersection with Route 12 in Oxford. To improve safety, a median will be installed. To improve, multimodal, eh, to improve multimodal mobility, pedestrian and bicycle accommodations will be improved. The existing signalized intersections at Richardson's Corner, Route 56, and Route 12 will be upgraded. With the inclusion of a median, the team evaluated several locations along the corridor to provide full access intersections that would facilitate vehicles looking to reverse directions. 
Loca locations that were evaluated but dismissed include the intersection of Glenmere and Bay Path in Charlton and the intersection of Pioneer Road, a Pioneer Drive in Oxford. The decision was made that the best location to provide a full access intersection was the intersection of Oxbow Road in Oxford. And the 25% design hearing showed a new traffic signal at that location. Since the design public hearing, it has been determined that the intersection does not meet warrants for a traffic signal. At the February public information meeting, we briefly discussed our efforts between MassDOT and the design builder to design an alternative to, tr alternative to traffic signals. The resulting intersection design is a high speed roundabout. This design is nearing completion and will be discussed later in the presentation by the design builder. Additional work in the project includes replacing the Route 20 bridges over Little and French River, optimizing drainage, and introducing, introducing the best management practices for stormwater treatment. Now I'll hand off to Lenny Velichansky from Chan Systems to speak more about the elements of the design and the final design development. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Chris said, I'm Lenny Velichansky. I'm design manager for Chan Systems. A quick update on where the design currently stands. We're on target to complete the design this summer. Our design includes a major change to the proposed intersection of Oxbow Road with Route 20. The preliminary design, as Chris mentioned, <clears throat> that some of you may have seen during the earlier project development phase, included traffic signals at this location. As the project progressed further, it was determined that this intersection would not meet the warrants for the installation of traffic signals prescribed by the manual on uniform traffic control devices. This manual is a national standard adopted by the Federal Highway Administration for designing traffic control devices. Recognizing that the signals were not warranted, we came up with an alternative solution that satisfies project requirements of safely providing full access to and from Oxbow Road and accommodating U-turns at this location. This solution is to construct a roundabout. Before I get into detailed discussion of the roundabout, I would like to remind some of you what, uh, who may have missed the February meeting, what the overall project corridor will look like. This slide illustrates a typical cross section of Route 20 between Route 56 and Route 12. It will have two lanes in each direction, separated by a raised median island with guardrail. We will also introduce four foot shoulders on the right side of each roadway and two foot shoulders on the left side adjacent to the median. Also a sidewalk on the south or eastbound side will be extended from Route 12 to Route 56 and a shared use path will be constructed on the north westbound side. The western portion of the corridor from Route 56 to Richardson Corner will be similar, except there will be no sidewalk and the shared use path will terminate at Oxbow Road in Oxford. Also, instead of the median island with guardrail, the opposing flows of traffic will be separated with a concrete, concrete barrier. Now I would like to focus on the Oxbow Road roundabout. One of the key features of the roundabout is, of any roundabout, is their increased safety. safety. By properly designing the roadway geometry, speeds are greatly and gradually reduced as vehicles approach the roundabout. This results in similar vehicle speeds between the entering and circulating traffic. Achieving similar slow speeds greatly reduces potential for and severity of crashes. Statistics show that compared to other types of intersections, roundabouts experience a 35% decrease in total crashes, and more importantly, a 75% reduction in crashes involving injuries or fatalities. These schematics illustrate how in general, roundabouts provide superior safety compared to intersections. The orange dots represent conflict points or areas of potential vehicle crashes. As shown on the left, a typical four-way intersection has 32 conflict points. A roundabout shown on the right has eight. 
This explains why the roundabouts have proven to have a significantly, significantly lower crash rate. This illustration helps understand the reduction in severity of crashes. An intersection is more likely to have a high speed collision at a 90 degree angle or worse head on. The two schematics on the left show a vehicle on a side street colliding with a high speed vehicle on a major road or left turning vehicles colliding with through traffic. Both of these types of crashes have potential for serious injury. The image on the right shows a potential collision at a roundabout. As mentioned previously, because speeds are significantly reduced for both entering and circulating traffic, and because the angle between the two vehicles is much sharper, this type of a collision is more likely to result in a less severe outcome. Approaches to the roundabouts are clearly marked, indicating lane assignments in advance. Like at intersections, signs and pavement markings guide drivers, drivers to appropriate lanes, eliminating the need to change lanes at the roundabout. The result is improved traffic flow through the roundabout and again, increased safety. Not every roundabout or not every intersection rather is suitable for a roundabout. But where appropriate, well-designed roundabouts have demonstrated operational superiority to traffic signals by reducing vehicle delays and queues. They also provide easier U-turn movements, which is especially important for trucks, emergency vehicles, and school buses. All of these features have been incorporated into the design of the Oxbow Road Roundabout. This rendering shows what the proposed roundabout will look like when the project is completed. To get oriented, looking from the north, Route 20 is running left to right, and Oxbow Road is at the bottom of this image. The driveway to Army's Towing is integrated with the roundabout, and the John Deere business is just to the east. Both eastbound and westbound Route 20 through movements continue through the roundabout in two lanes, while single lanes are provided for the U-turns and vehicles entering or leaving Oxbow Road. The roundabout is designed to accommodate large trucks, while a tighter Oxbow Road approach is sufficient for school buses and fire trucks. You can see the shared use path along the south or westbound side of Route 20. As I mentioned previously, the shared use path terminates here at Oxbow Road. Another element introduced in the design is roadway lighting. The roundabout and approaches to it will be well lit to provide safe visibility during dark hours. Finally, currently there is a pipe under a 20 in this area that conveys a small stream. This pipe will be replaced with two large box culverts one under Oxbow Road and another one under 20. You can see the relocated channel in the middle of this rendering. Both culverts will have provisions for wildlife passage. This is a brief overview of the proposed roundabout. And now I will turn over to Jack Harney to discuss construction activities. All right, thank you, Lenny. I'm Jack Harney, project manager for DWA Construction. And uh, I am going to be discussing a construction overview. So the overall time frame for the project is approximately four years. We expect it to be completed in November of 2026. DWA will typically perform most work during the daytime hours. Typical work hours will be 7 to 3.30. Some work may vary depending on traffic volumes between 5 a.m. and 7 p.m. There will occasionally be night and weekend work for some demolition and off-peak work that needs lane taking to execute the work. Single lane closures will continue on weekdays for ongoing work activities. We will always maintain access for emergency services. We will be in contact with all of our first responders to maintain communication throughout the performance of the contract. All major operations will be confined to fixed work zones. We will minimize construction vehicle turning movements to reduce the impacts on traveling public. Uh, travel speeds will be reduced through the work zones 
for the safety of our workforce and the traveling public. DWA will be using water spray for dust suppression throughout the project. Wide load prohib prohibited from work zone. MassDOT was implemented a restriction that prohibits vehicles from carrying wide loads over eight feet, six inches on Route 20 between Route 12 and Richardson's Corner. This restriction is in place Mondays through Fridays from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., primarily our work hours. Any vehicles carrying wide loads should avoid the work zone, seek alternate routes, and contact MassDOT's Commercial Truck Permits Office for more information. You can see that information on that slide. Uh, current work activities. We are continuing to do our erosion control and vegetation clearing along Route 20 to help prepare for site, prepare the site for utility relocations. This work will wrap up later this month and is being performed during the day from 7 to 3.30, Monday through Friday. This work requires intermittent, short-term, single-lane closures of Route 20 eastbound and westbound. Utility pole relocations. The utility companies are installing new utility poles along Route 20 to relocate the overhead wires and allow for a wider road. This will continue during the day, Monday through Friday from 7 to 3.30. This work will continue to, to involve intermittent short-term lane closures of Route 20 eastbound and westbound. I will now hand it over to Chris Gagney to discuss the next steps. Chris. Thank you, Jack. Again, Christopher Gagney. Uh, Mass DOT project manager. After tonight's meeting, the next steps of the project are as follows. The early construction activities will continue this spring into summer. We will meet with the public again to provide more information as the design is completed. As the final design is expected to be completed, the stage construction is anticipated to begin in July. We anticipate that construction will be substantially completed in September of 2026 and will be fully completed in November of 2026. Now I'll hand off to Sarah Peritsky from Regina Villa Associates to discuss how we will keep you informed. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Peritsky with Regina Villa Associates, and I am managing the public outreach and communications for the project. Our public outreach team is assisting MassDOT by implementing a timely and informative outreach program. We want to make sure stakeholders are aware of the project and receive timely updates to help you plan your participation and choose how to follow the project. We've already held a number of public meetings and continue to hold briefings with local and state officials and neighborhood stakeholders as needed. We will hold additional meetings at key project milestones as the design and construction continue. We're maintaining a robust email database, which includes key contacts from regional and local organizations, municipalities, and elected officials. Those contacts and anyone else who chooses to sign up for our emails, the link is on the screen, um, will receive email updates on a regular basis before key project milestones and in advance of construction activities and traffic impacts. We will also continue to keep the project website updated with project information and announcements. For the latest project information, we encourage you to visit our project website uh, that is on the screen. It's www.mass.gov slash root hyphen 20 hyphen reconstruction hyphen project hyphen in hyphen Charlton hyphen Oxford. Our project email address is dot3 at dot.state.ma.us. Um, You'll see we have a project hotline for urgent construction related issues, which our team is monitoring during work hours. That number is 508-990-5012. And finally, you can find MassDOT on social media. Now I'd like to turn it back over to Leah to discuss the format of the question and answer session. Leah? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we are going to take Q&A now, and I'll go over how we will do that. But the very first thing I'd like to mention is that 
at MassDOT, we have a tradition of taking questions and comments from public or elected officials before we get to the general public. So if you are a public or elected official and you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, you can click the raise hand button now and uh, type your name in and title into the Q&A so we can properly recognize you. I'll give a couple moments to do that. And while any public officials are doing that, I'll go over our Q&A rules. So you can raise your hand to be unmuted for verbal questions. That shortcut is Alt-Y if you prefer a keyboard. You can also submit your written questions and comments using the Q&A button. Please state your name before asking your question and share only one question or comment at a time and limit it to two minutes so that everyone can participate. If you're joining us via phone today, you can dial star nine and the moderator will call out the last four digits or so of your phone number and unmute your audio when it's your turn. And finally, I'll remind everyone that uh, when you choose to close out from the Zoom webinar, uh, a survey will automatically pop up in your browser. Please take that survey and let us know how your experience was with this virtual meeting. So that being said, it looks like we've got a couple public or elected officials to recognize first. So I'll turn this over to Kit. Thank you. Um, first, we have Kylie Gibbons, a dis district director um, and state senator Ryan Fatman. Um, Kylie, you can unmute your microphone now. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm joining on behalf of Senator Fatman, who is unable to join himself, but um, I don't have a question. Just wanted to say thanks for doing this. I know it takes a lot of work to put presentations together and think through um, all of these different options and scenarios. So just um, on behalf of the Senator, wanted to say thank you. And um, we continue to offer any um, help or guidance or any way that we can be helpful as you move through this process, um, especially as you disseminate information to various people. We're happy to help that along um, with our constituents. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have um, we have Steve Coronas, the selectman from Charlton. You can unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the, the roundabout's an interesting idea, certainly. I hadn't seen that one before. Um, well, my question is, is the just east of the roundabout, where the sharp corner is, is that wall, that large stone wall going to be removed and that corner straightened a little bit, or is it, or, you hope, or, or is it playing that the roundabout's going to slow traffic down enough that that's not going to have to be a problem? It's probably just out of the screen to, on the bottom right. There's a large stone wall in a sharp corner. Can you hear me? I'm... Yes, we I don't, can. I don't, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't believe we are affecting that wall. To be honest with you, I have to go back and take another look at the plans, but I don't think that is being affected. Yeah. Uh, what this roundabout actually did is uh, by slightly changing the geometry of approaches, we are actually pushing it a little bit away uh, from that parcel. So uh, again, I will have to double check that, but yeah. that, that wall is not going to be affected. I just asked, I think a year ago, I heard that they weren't going to touch the wall, but then I saw a lot of clearing going on. I was just curious. It's not, no, I, I, the, I like the idea of the roundabout. That's, that's really the only question I had. So thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Thanks very much, Steve. Yep. Uh, it looks like, 
think I don't see any more public or elected officials with their hands raised. So let's open it up to the general public. So again, you can raise your hand or you can type your question into the Q&A. Uh, maybe we can navigate ourselves back to those Q&A instructions just in case anyone needs them. All right, and I'll turn this back over to Kit. It looks like we have a raised hand. Thank you. Uh, PJ, PJ, you can unmute your microphone. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, yes, I also agree The I, I think the roundabout looks really great. Um, I was really surprised. And um, I think that's a, a good, I think that's a good point. Um, but my, my question is, is um, the road that goes from 56 up to Richardson Corner, I didn't hear much talked about that. And um, some of the, the, the photos are kind of small, you can't really see sort of what's going on there. But I have two things. Um, one, when traffic from the Mass Pike gets backed up, et cetera, um, from 12 and 20 all the way up through Richardson Corner, you know, a lot of times through Sturbridge, from Sturbridge to Auburn, people are jumping off the pike and they're hitting that part of the road. And sometimes you can't even get home. <laughs> so I think the widening of the road is going to, I mean, it's going to definitely cause more, it's, it, I mean, it's going to be more traffic. Um, yes, I think it's going to flow better and everything, but sometimes people cut off and come down Bay Path Road. And if there's an accident or something, they veer onto the Bay Path Road and they cut down this road. And I'm telling you, they're doing like 60 miles an hour. And um, it, this is a very small road. It's barely a mile long. And I'm not saying that it's not happening on other roads um, as well, but um, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with that, with this road widening and plus the noise level? I mean, I can literally hear people hitting their cars and, you know, crying on the roads out there when they get into accidents. So, you know, so what's going to happen with that? Is the noise level, it already went up since they put that solar farm there in the corner, but with this traffic and the widening of the, of the roads, um, what, you know, what's going to stop all that, that noise pollution level? Um, and uh, like I said, from Friday night through Sunday, there's uh, the speed out there is atrocious. I mean, they do not do 50, 55 miles an hour. So um, anyways, so I guess that's a couple things. And I'm just concerned. Thank, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Joe Farley from our District 3 office, can you uh, answer the corridor question? Yeah, yes, hi, and, and thank you for the question. Um, so we, we certainly know um, that Route 20 uh, is a heavily traveled road. And as you said, especially on the weekend, uh, when people love to use it as a way to avoid the issues on, on the turnpike. Um, and so, you know, the, the design of, of the project and, and the design of the roundabout um, really isn't intended to necessarily um, make Route 20 much more attractive to traffic, but, but will help allow traffic when they are on Route 20 to progress through. Uh, I, I think your your point about speed is a is a is a really important comment. And one of the things that we think this roundabout at, at Oxbow Road will help with in that general area is that roundabouts do require uh, cars to slow down as, as they go through. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily require them to do the uh, the slamming on of brakes that traffic signal does. So hopefully, maybe that will help with the uh, the noise some. Um, but we'll provide at least one spot where people will will have to um, slow down a little bit along the corridor. Uh, certainly, as we designed this section of Route 20, and um, it's something that uh, was covered with the cross section very quickly. Um, you know, we did look to try to design this corridor in a way a little, a little bit differently than the, uh, the Charlton section to the west uh, of this project. 
um, to not necessarily promote quite as high speed. Um, but one of the things that is that is part of this project is several measures, including things like speed feedback signs that are already out there and other measures to uh, to try to uh, address the speed along the corridor because we, we know that's an issue as well. Um, so hopefully that answers the uh, the first part of the uh, the question, Chris, and I think we're, we're going to have someone else try to talk about the uh, the noise aspect as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Uh, yes, uh, Richard Kelly from HDR, uh, MassDOT's uh, design consultant, uh, can answer the question about noise. Nope, oh, you're muted, Rich. Nope. It looks like Rich may be having some audio issues. Rich, are you able to uh, maybe disconnect your headphones and try that? Uh, otherwise, we'll come back. All right, that did not help. We will try to help out Rich. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to read a question from the Q&A and hopefully we'll be able to get back to the noise question. So from the Q&A, Barbara, my name is Barbara. What has been done to protect the turtles who cross in various spots along Route 20, particularly westbound just before Richardson Corner? Thank you, Barbara. And it looks like Jonathan Nero uh, from the design build team is going to answer that one. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Barbara, for the question. Uh, again, John Nero uh, with the design build team managing the environmental permitting for the project. Uh, so two answers to this question. Uh, one is um, construction period protection. So just east of Richardson's Corner, where the Little River uh, flows under Route 20, is actually a corridor mapped by the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program as a uh, endangered wood turtle um, habitat. So during construction, uh, all work in these areas are required to be cordoned off with um, uh, construction fencing that prevents turtles from entering the work zone. And we also have a qualified turtle biologist in the field doing what's called turtle sweeps checking for these turtles before any construction activity begins for the day in these areas. Um, Long-term um, protection of turtles for the life of the project includes um, at that crossing of the Little River under Route 20, there will be chain link fencing or similar put up to sort of guide turtles under that bridge rather than having them crawl up the slope onto the roadway. And then as mentioned earlier by some of the uh, design build team members, there are a number of pipes conveying streams under the roadway uh, that are going to be replaced. With Testing box one, two, three. That will allow for uh, wildlife passage. It'll essentially give them a dry shelf next to the stream uh, to cross under the roadway, creating more favorable conditions and reducing the likelihood that they go into the roadway. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And it sounded like we may have uh, just gotten Rich's audio to work. So I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes. So let's jump back to the noise part of that last question. Excellent. So, PJ, um, uh, I was involved back um, during the preliminary design of the project. And during that time, MassDOT conducted a, a noise analysis. And there's certainly, uh, there's certain criteria that needs to be met to do um, mitigation efforts. And in a couple of select locations along the project corridor, uh, those situations uh, were met, but it's not feasible to provide those mitigation efforts. And in part because we've all seen the, um, uh, the noise walls or, or noise barriers along the highways. And each time you put a cut in those walls, for, for instance, for driveways, it, it makes it ineffective. Um, in addition, you know, the, those bedrooms, those residences that have the wall in front of them, it, it's, not, um, it's not something that's desired. 
Um, in terms of the solar farm, I've I've heard that from um, from other folks uh, have raised that concern, but it's really beyond the um, uh, the ability to mass dot to to govern. You know what a a private parcel owner does. Does that answer your question? Oh, apologies. She, I removed um, removed permission. Hold on, PJ. PJ, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Am I there? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, that that did. Um, it, of course, it did answer the question. Um, a little discouraged, but I, I can understand what you're saying. Um, you know how it's not feasible to you know to put those types of walls up and um, and everything. Um, I just I think more concerning is that it just seems like the whole focus is on like the Route 56 area and not the area that's actually having the accidents. And it's after 56. Once you slow those cars down around that rotary, and then they start coming up that portion of the highway to Richardson Corner and beyond, that's where that's where all the, you know, the speeding issues come in. So um, I just hope it makes it better. That's all. But thank you all for answering my question. Thank you, PJ. Uh, our next raised hand is from Mark Arsensalt. You can unmute your microphone, Mark. Yes, uh, Mark Arsenal, uh, 98 Oxbow Road in Charlton here. Uh, I've been a resident here for 59 years, and uh, I've seen many accidents out there, so these changes are certainly welcome. Uh, my question is, uh, the, uh, the rotary on, on the rotary that we used to be designed and present, presented tonight, uh, do you have a timetable? Uh, in the overall project, when that turn, that roundabout would be uh, would be done. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, Lenny or Jack, could you answer the uh, question about the uh, proposed construction? Yes, I, I can start, and then uh, I'm sure Jack can fill in too. But uh, <clears throat> you know, construction is going to be staged. Uh, obviously, this thing, we can, unfortunately, we cannot wish it in place. So it has to be done incrementally. Uh, so this is a multi-stage construction project and the roundabout will be constructed also in stages. So if you're looking for when it will be opened in its final shape, it's going to be near the end of the project. Uh, we may be able to open it a little bit sooner uh, than the the final completion of the project, but it's going to be closer towards the uh, end of it. Jack, do you have anything to add to that? No, that's correct, Lenny. Uh, the intent is to get the roadway uh, in over 2024 and 2025. Uh, in our wildest dreams, would love to have it done at the end of 2025 with contract runs to 2026. Could probably get it roughed in by 2025, but uh, with all projects, uh, what happens is from a weather perspective, we need warm temperatures to put on the final course of paving. Uh, and usually we're restricted somewhere between April 15th and September 15th of the uh, of that year to put the paving down. So uh, I'd love to tell you the end of 2025, but it may leak into 2026. Okay. I hope that answered your question. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, it does. Thank you. No problem. All right, thank you all. We're going to turn back to the written Q and A. The next one is from Ralph, who asks: Is there a plan for a buffer to replace all the trees that have been removed? Thank you, Ralph. Thanks for the question, Ralph. Uh, there is a planting plan uh, proposed for the uh, project once the uh, roadway has been realigned in addition to the, uh, the many uh, walls that are being installed in addition to the, uh, the roundabout that's planned. Um, as far as the types and uh, what the uh, 
what's going to be planted. Lenny, can you speak to that as far as what's designed for uh, being planted in the uh, areas off, off the roadway and uh, in front of any of the, the walls that are being constructed? Uh, well, there's really the, the main uh, area where we will have some additional, some new landscaping is the roundabout. Uh, so there will be uh, some vegetation uh, inside the circle of the roundabout. Uh, but other than that, the, the ability to really do much is limited because of the right-of-way constraints and there are wetlands for a large uh, part of this corridor and a lot of it is right against uh, wetlands, which is why there will be a number of retaining walls there to stay out of wetlands. It's a narrow corridor. Um, so the ability to do, uh, to place more vegetation outside of the corridor is limited. Obviously, all the disturbed areas will be covered with uh, grass. Uh, but as far as trees go, um, I think that opportunity is fairly limited. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you. I'll take uh, one more Q&A before we go back to the raised hands. This one's from Chris, who asks, can you tell me what is being done to straighten out the bad curve? Thank you, Chris. Chris, thank you. Uh, that uh, bad curve is being uh, straightened out at speed. The roadway is being realigned there uh, to make this roadway uh, straighter and wider for uh, sight distance so that vehicles have uh, kind of more room to move, uh, but they can also see further uh, of what's, a, what's ahead of them uh, as they come around that corner. Uh, Lenny, could you speak to what the specifics about the design for that, or at least a, uh, an overview of uh, how that's being done? Yeah, we're, we're introducing uh, a wide shoulder on the inside where the uh, median is, and that will definitely improve, significantly improve the sight distance along that curve. And we're also flattening the horizontal curvature a little bit to make it less pronounced. So those are the two main uh, measures that we can take there. Like I said, we'll flatten the curve a little bit and we'll widen, we improve the sight distance more. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mark Arsensalt again. Um, you can unmute your microphone, Mark. Yes, uh, Mark Arsensalt again, Oxbow Road. Uh, your shared roof, shared bike path and sidewalk and the sidewalk going to uh, 56 to Cumberland Farms. Will that be, uh, Will, will the guardrail be between the bike path and the road, or will, will it be adjacent to the road? The guardrail will be at the back of the shared use path. Uh, there will be some retaining walls there, so to protect uh, people on the bike, uh, on the shared use path, uh, there will be a guardrail there at the back of it. So what you're saying is the bike path and the road will be adjacent to each other with no protection, is that correct? Uh, the bike path will be adjacent to the road, that's correct. Isn't that kind of unsafe? Uh, a car, if there was an accident, they went up on the bike path or the sidewalk, uh, I would think that would be very unsafe. Will there be a berm between the bike path and the road? Uh, yeah, there will be vertical curb. So the bike path is going to be uh, separated from the road. It's elevated. It's, it's a six inch vertical curb. It just sounds very unsafe to me. You know, again, it, a lot of this is driven by just this being a very narrow corridor uh, between right of way and the wetlands. Uh, there's only so much that we can fit in there. Well, I've, I've seen accidents on Route 20 where cars get out of control or where there's ice or whatever and they spin out. And I mean, they'd be up on that sidewalk, I'm sure. 
well, it's, you know, introducing vertical curve will definitely make it safer because right now there are a lot of areas that are not as well defined where the, where the edges of the road are. Uh, so that'll make it safer. And, uh, you know, I think like Joe mentioned before, uh, the roundabout will help reducing speeds through that area. I, I realize that, but there's, there's instances where uh, it's an act of nature or whatever it is, or another car speeding and hits a car, uh, they go off the road. And off the road through the bike path, uh, uh, if there's anybody walking along the road, uh, it sounds like uh, too much. There wasn't much thought in the safety of people walking along the bike path on a fairly high speed road. Uh, Agreed, it slows down with the, with the roundabout, the traffic lights, but people tend to speed up and uh, they don't want the time or when, the, when you get a little ice on the road, uh, things happen. Uh, I, I just wish that you had a little more protection for the people that are going to be walking on the side of the road. Well, there's also, there will be a separation between the uh, shared use path and the traffic travel lanes. There's a four foot shoulder. Today there isn't a, there aren't any shoulders there, so there will be a constant constant four foot shoulder on the right side of the road, uh, which will provide additional separation. How high will that shoulder be? That shoulder is the same elevation as the road. Thank you I so don't... much, Mark. Okay. Yeah, um, we are going to move to the Q and A. Uh, the next question is a question from Debbie, who asks, is there a sidewalk on the Thayer Pond side of Route 20? There are, there are 226 units on that side, the north side. Uh, plans show a bike path. Thank you, Debbie. Yes, the, uh, the shared use path, uh, what you're seeing as a bike path is uh, shared use. It's meant to be shared by both bicyclists as well as pedestrians. Uh, I believe that section of uh, shared use path is eight feet wide. Uh, so there, it, there is room to accommodate uh, both bicycles and pedestrians uh, while getting them out of the traveled roadway. All right, and I will read another question from the Q&A from Karen. <clears throat> How is the entrance to Bay Path Road from Route 20 being designed? Right now, making a right-hand turn onto Route 20 from Bay Path Road, the sight lines in front of Helgerson's septic company are not good, especially when you line up the construction barrels. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Lenny, uh, could you uh, talk to the design about the uh, intersection with uh, Bay Path Road with the uh, the median uh, through Route 20? Well, the, the median is going to, the, the left turns uh, will be prohibited. They will be physically impossible to make both into Bay Path Road and out of Bay Path Road. As far as the right uh, turns, there really is, uh, uh, will take another look at to see if their radius can be flattened there a little bit. But uh, other than that, it's gonna be pretty much as it exists today. Thank right, that's you. It. Sorry, did I interrupt someone? Oh no, I was just uh, mumbling to myself. <laughs> All right, so we are out of Q&A and raised hands for the time being. Oh, just got a couple more. Um, but maybe this is also a good time to uh, navigate us back to the slide with the contact information and remind everyone that in case for any reason you're not comfortable uh, you know, sharing your question in a public forum or you have to leave the option to send in your questions and comments by email is also available. So I'm going to read another question from the Q&A. This one's from John Perkins. In reference to the bike lane separation and safety, if a guardrail is not an option, perhaps at least a four-foot fence. 
less of a footprint and some protection. Thank you, John. Uh, yes, as, as Lonnie alluded to earlier, uh, there are um, reasons why a barrier can't be placed at the edge of the shared use path. Uh, there's width restrictions. There's only so much of the corridor that we could take up with the construction of the roadway and fitting in the shared use path to get people out of people and bicyclists out of the road. Um, and there are, are regulations that prohibit any kind of non-safety barrier, a double guardrail at the or guardrail at the front and back of the sidewalk would take up uh, a good amount of room, and it may not be able, may, it may not have been able to fit the entire shared use path in uh, where it is today. To again, to keep people out of the road. Um, Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Um, sure, Chris. I, I mean, I, I think that um, you know what, what we'll do is we'll we'll look and see what options um, might be available to try to address the concern. I know um, when we introduced the shared use path during our preliminary design, uh, we we struggled with a lot of the, a lot of the things that Lenny mentioned earlier about the the very tight nature of the corridor and the challenge to provide a width and so we worked with uh, with our staff that is uh, very focused on pedestrian and cyclist safety to try to come up with the the best alternative but uh, you know certainly given the the comments that were you know made tonight we'll we'll see if there is anything that we can do uh, certainly something that is like a guardrail as, as Chris said um, is very difficult to do between a shared use path and the roadway given where it has to be placed to meet safety standards and end treatments and the need there's it there it gets very complex but i i think we'll certainly look and see uh if there are any any things that we can do within the constraints on the corridor to try to address the address the issue um, you know, certainly we're trying to provide some some facilities on, on the part of the corridor East Foxboro Road uh, to try to accommodate bikes, uh, bikes and cyclists. And as um, as Lenny mentioned before, also trying to do what we can to try to bring vehicle speeds down a little bit on the corridor um, to try to address some of those issues, uh, concerns as well about what happens with a with an errant vehicle. But thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joe. The next question is from Karen, who asks, on the bad curve on Route 20 heading west after the proposed roundabout, how wide of a shoulder will there be between the right-hand lane and the stone wall that is there already? Thank you, Karen. Uh, I believe Lenny already spoke to this uh, question. Uh, am I, Lenny, am I right, Ned? It's eight feet? Is that what, is that what? No, the, this is the shoulder on the right side, if I'm... Okay. If I understand the question correctly, the shoulder on the right side is four feet throughout the entire project, end to end. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Matthew. Matthew asks, is there a website or link to see all the maps and renderings of the proposed plans? Thank you, Matthew. Uh, is someone able to answer Matthew's question? I believe the uh, project uh, information is on the uh, website. Uh, you can get there by uh, clicking on the link on the screen uh, as it's shown. Thank you, Chris. Um, I will put that link in the chat in a moment as well. Um, and then Heidi has a similar question. Can we access this presentation after tonight? And is it being recorded? Heidi, I can help you out with one of those. It is being recorded. And yes, uh, again, it is. it will be available on the website. The recording does take a bit of time uh, to get uploaded, only because it has to be uh, matched with the closed captioning. 
um, that does take uh, a little bit of time. It could be a few weeks, but this meeting uh, will be posted to the uh, project website. Thank you. Uh, and one more question in the Q&A right now. This one's from Jeff. Oh, it's a, it's a comment, but I will read it. I realize this meeting is more about the roundabout tonight. Just wanted to voice my concern over the need to slow traffic in front of Bay Path Road for safe exit and entrance to the highway. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. All right, and that's the last question in the Q&A right now. I haven't seen any more raised hands either. Again, we have that project email on screen. If you prefer to write in your questions or comments that way, uh, we'll give it uh, about 30 more seconds to see if anyone has any last minute questions and then we'll start to wrap up. And I've, uh, I've typed out the project website in the chat so you can copy and paste it if you'd like. Looks like we have one more raised hand. Harry Williams, you can unmute your microphone. I have unmuted, thank you. I live in North Oxford and am concerned about the intersection of 20 and 56. There's a lot of work being done there. Um, there's all the discussion you've had about the roundabout at Oxbow Road. Is there any discussion of it being a roundabout at 56 and 20, or will it still be an intersection? I, I can take that. Uh, the, it's still going to, going to be an intersection, but there's significant improvements proposed at this intersection. There'll be additional lanes, turning lanes, uh, added. Uh, the intersection will also accommodate U-turns, so there will be some uh, bulb outs for, for the U-turning traffic. Uh, so it will be significantly improved in terms of its capacity, uh, both uh, the traffic level of service and, and uh, queuing. Thank you. Um, the answer actually indicate something of great concern to the folks from Thayer Pond Village, which as you indicated, there will be the ability to make a U-turn because they will have to turn right leaving there and most of many of them head for Worcester from there. So uh, thank you. Thank you much. Sure. Thank you. Okay. All right. It's about 7.04. Uh, we've been on for about an hour and I don't see any other questions. So Chris, I will turn it back over to you to wrap us up. Thank you, Leah. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and for those questions uh, we received this evening. Uh, again, you can find more information on the uh, website listed on the screen and that was uh, copied into the chat. Uh, there is a, a hotline. There's also the uh, project email that can be used. There's a number of ways to get in touch with the uh, project team uh, for this, uh, for the work that's going to be done. Uh, that being said, again, my name is Christopher Gagney. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. <laughs>